So welcome, brothers, to this evening's presentation, a historical overview of the Knights of the Golden Circle. First things first, this is not a tiled meeting. Please govern yourselves accordingly. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be uploaded into the Grand Lodge's YouTube channel. Please keep yourself on mute during the presentation. Uh, you can press the space bar to temporarily unmute yourself. And consider using the chat feature to send questions to the host. We'll cover them at the end. Uh, there will also be a poll at the end, about five minutes before the end of the meeting. Please submit uh, your responses before leaving. And as I'd mentioned, the videos will be available at the Grand Lodge YouTube channel. We do currently have some sessions scheduled. Um, the next being Freemasonry in the Roman Catholic Church, The Conflict Examined, Part 1 and 2. Also of note is the session on June 23rd has uh, some copyright material, so it will not be recorded. So if you are interested in A Light in the Darkness, please be sure to attend that one in person. If you'd like to suggest a topic or have something that you would like to present, there is a suggestion form. Uh, with the link at the bottom of this slide. The show and tell challenge continues. Please uh, take this to your lodges. We're basically looking to capture a very historical moment in time with what's happened over the past year uh, with regard to the COVID pandemic and how lodges have had to adjust. There's three questions that are being posed. What is Freemasonry? What will your life and legacy say about Freemasonry? How will you help others find the way to the rewards of the craft? Sponsored by three Grand Lodge committees. It is an opportunity to win a plaque and guaranteed uh, a certificate. Um, originally, this was going to be a video challenge. We'd still very much like to see that, but it's open to other mediums such as poetry, essays, and the like. For more information, uh, please visit bythecompass.org front slash challenge. And just to note that the C in challenge is case sensitive. Uh, if you do have something that you would like to present at an upcoming seminar, please email the mentoring committee. Uh, email is on the slide as well as the phone number. And now the future presentation, a historical overview of the Knights of the Golden Circle. And please give me one moment to switch which screen I'm sharing and we will resume momentarily. Okay, is everyone seeing my title slide? Yes, okay, good deal. So thank you for having me back, brothers. It's been a couple of weeks since we last chatted. Uh, tonight's going to be a little bit of a, a different presentation than I would normally give. Uh, it's, it's an attempt to talk about a Civil War secret society called the Knights of the Golden Circle. Um, it is called a historical overview. Uh, however, I will share it is... Uh, a group that was secretive, so it's it's hard to be extraordinarily historical. Um, that said, I will try to to be uh, very clear about things that I've captured that um, are legend. Some disclaimers: um, the following is based on my research and does not reflect any views of the Grand Lodge or any lodge for that that matter. Um, there's, there are topics in the presentation that may be sensitive. Uh, please understand that I share these topics only to help with understanding and reflect a part of the U.S. history. Um, and as I stated, I'm not a historian. With that said, I do love a good story. And as a part of that, I collect coins. Uh, one of the reasons I love coins is because it sparks my imagination with regard to the stories they tell and what hands they've been in and in what conditions. So example, if I look at a mercury dime uh, from the Great Depression, I'm reminded of an area not too far from my house in Southeast Minnesota that was called Shantytown. Uh, and it was basically an area where people banded together near Rochester, Minnesota, 
uh, built shelters, helped feed each other, and banded together to survive the Great Depression. Something I, I think is very beautiful and is um, a story that I, I like to reflect on. Likewise, when I see coins from the mid 1800s, uh, it, it's almost immediately uh, something of, of wonderment to me. Uh, as a kid, I was interested in the Revolutionary War and how we banded together um, in order to get independence in the United States. The Civil War was not something really that, that was of tremendous interest to me. That was more my father and father-in-law. But as I get older, uh, I do wonder about this period and how we went from brothers bending together to fight for independence to a nation that was split. But I'll be honest, some of those interests changed within the last few years. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm focused more and more on the Civil War and trying to understand it. Uh, in 2004, I watched National Treasure. Um, and that was really, this, there was a scene with, with Nicolas Cage and Harvey Keitel near the end of the movie that was really the straw that broke the camel's back and, and brought me to masonry. A few years later, they came out with a sequel called National Treasure Book of Secrets. In that particular movie, there was an anti-hero played by Ed Harris who had family lineage to a, a secret society called the Knights of the Golden Circle. I didn't think much of it until a few years later when I was introduced to the gentleman on the right, and that's Rick and Marty Lagina. Uh, they have a, a television show called The Curse of Oak Island, and Oak Island is an interesting place uh, that, that has some history that, that crosses with masonry in so much that there's been intrigue about a rumor that there's treasure buried there, and um, our own Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually spent a tremendous amount of time looking for the treasure on the island. And as a side note, uh, one of the rumors is it is lost Templar treasure. A couple of years ago, they, they started funding another effort and launched a spinoff program called Civil War Gold uh, that's really based on some of the topics that we're going to talk about tonight uh, and is one of the, the other catalysts for the interest in tonight's topic. Sprinkle that in with, as a kid, I always had an interest in growing up to be Indiana Jones, and, and that's how we got here. Interestingly enough, the story actually does begin with the Revolutionary War um, and an understanding that in the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Thomas Jefferson had, had penned a section that basically um, tried to outlaw slavery and condemned it uh, extremely. But it was removed from the final draft because of economic pressures and fear of losing states in the South. That said, in 1776, Delaware did make it illegal to import slaves. And there were a group of colonists, um, specifically Quakers in Philadelphia, that began to start pushing for the outlaw of slavery. It's important to understand that uh, values in the country were evolving. Uh, not everyone saw slaves as being equal uh, to other, other men. And I guess the silver lining that I might offer is the fact that there were discussions and there was evolution in this mindset. So this tension began to grow and it's, it's important to say that the Industrial Revolution uh, was beginning near the beginning of the founding of this country. Uh, it, it spanned between roughly 1760 and somewhere between 1820 and 1840. So 
it, it, it actually caused a huge dynamic between the, the North and the South. The South was largely was largely farming, um, looking at producing goods such as rice, sugar, cotton, tobacco, and indigo. And their means for production was an age-old solution uh, that goes back way throughout history. Uh, and that is basically using slave uh, manpower as a, of, as a means of production. Mechanization um, and machines started to be able to change that dialogue and I think was a, a pretty good portion of questioning um, whether or not slavery was was an appropriate way to move forward. And the North was transforming into an area that was focused on manufacturing, uh, manufacturing of cotton-based textiles, leather goods, and weapons. Initially, the, the North and the South were, were working together, but in 1828, there was a tariff passed um, on all imported products, and this was to help with competition from overseas. Uh, there, there was a clause that was added to that uh, particular legislation that exempted raw materials. And so some believed that it benefited the North and really hampered the South. Um, and that sentiment in the South went ev even further awry when they started looking at tariffs made up 90% of the federal revenue and railroads and canals were felt to be serving the North and not really helping um, the South. And the supplies of goods from the South to the North were being more and more ambushed by abolitionist groups. And the perspective of the South is that those abolitionist groups were not held accountable for the damaged goods. In 1832, there was a less harsh tariff that was passed, but the South still objected. Uh, South Carolina passed an ordinance of nullification, which prohibited the tariff being enforced in their borders. At the time, v Vice President Calhoun supported this ordinance of nullification uh, for South Carolina. And South Carolina promised that if there were any attempts to enforce the, the federal tariff, they would secede from the Union. Despite all this, President Jackson was reelected re by a large margin and denied the right for this nullification and denied the ability of states to ignore the federal law. As a result, Calhoun left vice presidency and took a senator seat and Jackson, uh, let's just say there was no love lost. There was, some attempts to smooth things over with a new bill that was brought forward that reduced the tariffs further for 10 years. It was enough to smooth things over with South Carolina that nullified the nullification bill and it, it delayed civil unrest and civil war. But ultimately, the South was afraid of, of the future of their economy and their livelihood uh, being taken away. Whereas in the North, they wanted to right a wrong that many, including the abolitionists, saw as morally corrupt and evil. Of course, we're talking North and South, but the lines aren't quite that simple. Uh, the North had sympathizers for the South called Copperheads, and there were also Unionists in the South. The next part of this story has to do with understanding some westward expansion. And we started gaining new territories and as those territories were realized, they began getting broken up into states. Missouri is a good example. And there was a compromise called the Missouri Compromise in 1820 uh, that basically uh, stopped legislation to outlaw slavery and it admitted Missouri as a slave state. 
but it also brought Maine in as a free state and prohibited slavery north of the 36 degree uh, 30 foot parallel with the exception of Missouri. Fast forward to about 1845, James Polk was our, was our president and he vowed from the US, vowed to the US people that he would expand the nation from the Atlantic Ocean to the, the Pacific Ocean which meant that he needed to take over British ter territory um, in form of the Oregon Territory and also uh, Mexican territory in order to get what today is California. In this time, there was a concept called filibustering, but it's not the same filibustering that we would think today on the Senate floor. Um, this was an idea where guerrillas would take over um, would unsanctioned uh, take over foreign territories and overthrow their rulers, uh, form new territories, and then in some cases, such as Texas, uh, would apply for statehood. Now, Texas is an interesting story because Mexico actually opened up uh, that area for settlers to go into thinking that the settlers would one day uh, become a part of Mexico. But led by uh, such people as Sam Houston and Davy Crockett, uh, those settlers basically formed the Texas Territory and broke off from Mexico and then applied for statehood and were granted statehood in 1845. However, the, the border of Texas was under dispute. Uh, the Mexican government said it was much further north, and the assertion was the Rio Grande was the, the border uh, from the U.S. perspective, and it led to the Mexican-American War between 1846 and 1848. Ultimately, the United States won that, and it earned uh, the U.S. the, the uh, Mexican cessation and unorganized territory, or in other words, it got us California, New Mexico, Utah, and other uh, future states of the Southwest. Additionally, the Oregon Territory was owned by Great Britain. Uh, the U.S. came forward and, and basically asked them to sign it over to us or face the potential for war. Uh, Great Britain did indeed sign it over and Polk kept his promise of expansion to the other coastline. But this set up an interesting environment where there was this power play between the free states and the slave states and representation in Congress. Um, and basically what ended up happening is for every slave state, there was a free state added to the union. That said, there were a tremendous amount of things going on that caused distrust uh, between the free states and the slave states. And as a result, in the South, there were a string of secret societies called Southern Rights Clubs that were formed. Uh, they were basically slave owners. Um, membership was plantation owners and the elite of Southern society. They had their own passwords and handshakes and rituals formed on the ideals of Calhoun and slavery um, was seen as the backbone of the Southern industries because they felt that the fate of the people in the South was really bound to the question of slavery. Uh, sentiments such as abolition and the union can't coexist were shared. It's important to understand that during this time, masonry was pretty much everywhere in the United States. And we already know that there were brothers that fought for the North and, and brothers that fought for the South. But in all my research, I did not find any mention that any of the groups we're going to talk about had direct Masonic affiliation. Rather, it's, it's that um, these fraternities borrowed ideas from each other. So with all that said, 
who exactly were the KGC, the Knights of the Golden Circle. And it was a secret society formed by a man by the name of George Washington Lafayette Bickley. Uh, it was a paramilitary group that borrowed ideas from other secret societies of the day. One thing that's unique about the KGC is it was an order that amassed its own military. To understand more about it, we have to understand more about George Bickley. His birthplace is uncertain, uh, depending on the source they mention Indiana, uh, but the general consensus seems to be that he was born July 18th, 1823 in Russell County, Virginia. And what's interesting is there's some sentiment that the fact that his birthplace is disputed was actually uh, caused by, by Bickley himself. His father died at age of 12, and um, because of that, his mother couldn't take care of him. I should, I should say his father died when George Bickley was 12. And since his mother couldn't take care of him, um, he ended up going and living on the streets, resorting to shoplifting and scavenging. And he did manage to start some small business that basically lifted him out of the streets. Uh, he found a mentor and a gentleman by the name of Dr. Patterson. And Bickley put himself through medical schools, including Philadelphia and New York, and attended the University of London with honors, graduating in 1842 at age of 18. Um, he did have an interest in uh, ph phrenology, um, which is basically an, an old type of medicine where they measured the skull and figured that they could uh, understand medical type issues based on that. And then he returned to America. Now I've got to say, there are recovered documents, letters to extended family and the like that dis that uh, dispute this timeline. And I guess based on the history of what's known with Bickley, this isn't surprising because he was a known storyteller, a smooth talker, and con man. He was also known as being extremely inventive, um, but having a short attention span with lots of failed ventures. And it's also said that he had a tremendous amount of problems with creditors. So in 1848, he married a wealthy widow by the name of V.F. Bell. And when she got wise to the fact that Buckley was after, or sorry, Bickley was after her money, uh, she left him and cut him off from that money. And as a result, Bickley started uh, conning his friends. In 1850, he did become a phrenologist and a medical practitioner and became obsessed with literature on medicine and pseudoscience, moved to Cincinnati to become a professor, and based on everything he had in, in, at the age of 27, it's, it's assured that he was a master charmer. Um, in 1853, he published a, a book called at Alaska, which from the sources I saw basically described it as a, a ripoff of Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, but unlike Stowe's classic, At Alaska was a flop. So Bickley started, uh, he decided to go against popularity and start looking at cashing in on secret societies and saw opportunities based on the Southern rights groups. And he started by uh, taking abolitionists for a fee down to plantations to, to take slaves and then would turn around for a fee and turn them into the slave owners. But on July 4th, 1854, he brought together four unidentified secessionists uh, that were pro-slavery and it's thought that they met in a deserted warehouse in Lexington, Kentucky, and they began to pen goals that ultimately became the Knights of the Golden Circle. They had a concept like lodges that they called castles, and the first castle was formed in Cincinnati. 
It's unknown what happened over the next five years. Uh, there wasn't a lot of activity, and some people think it's because Bickley was knocking heads with um, the other founders. Others think that he began to visit Southern right groups in order to get additional credibility. But whatever the case, uh, in 1859, the order resurrected in full. And they had the aim to expand into every state and really were thinking about using the, the method of filibustering uh, as the only way to combat abolitionists. And ultimately what they were looking to do was to build a slaveholding empire in the South with a capital in Havana, Cuba, uh, expanding through Confederate states into Mexico, the coastal region of the Gulf and Caribbean into Central America, uh, forming a circle. And Mexico was seen as the top priority um, with plans to break it into 15 slaveholding states that would be known as the Crescent. Um, and it was projected in order to do this that they would need 16,000 willing knights. They made a handbook of missions, tenants, rituals, and government structures. And as they were looking at building these castles, it wasn't that they were only looking at building new castles. They were also looking at uh, absorbing existing Southern right groups. And one such group that they ran into it was called the Order of the Lone Star. Uh, it was one of the leading Southern rights groups and its purpose was to free Cuba from Spanish rule and join the other slave states made up of Cuban expatriates and Southern explorers. Um, the OLS had three degrees focusing on political themes, fundraising and benevolence themes and military themes. Some believe that the KGC was actually an offshoot of the Order of the Lone Star. But absorbing the OLS, the KGC gained knights in the states of Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, and Louisiana. As far as the institution, they had their first convention in May of 1860 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, they did have three degrees. Their initiates were called neophytes. And there was significant memory work, handshake signals, and passwords. The signals helped to identify themselves as members, their rank, and also a need for help. Um, in fact, the military wing had their own signals and were instructed that if they saw another, even if it was a renegade, that it switched to the other side with the signals to basically not harm them. The fee structure was $1 to to go in through the, the first degree, $5 for the second and $10 for the third. In modern dollars, one of my sources said that would be about $23.90, then $199.50, then $239. But it's unclear uh, if that was a one-time fee uh, or if it were annual, but the funds went straight to Bickley uh, for overhead costs and that was actually a source of several people raising an eyebrow. Um, the title that, that Bickley took as the head of the order was President General of the American Legion. The first degree entailed a tremendous amount of military training in form of drills. The second had to do with political training and the third um, was, was a council of people responsible for day-to-day -day operations. Uh, they could make changes to the order, but only with the approval of Bickley himself. By May of 1860, the order had 48,000 members uh, that were comprised both of Southerners and Northern sympathizers, and 14,000 reported in the Army. They also had uh, ways of packing juries using their, their symbols. 
Um, and they they carried a token that could be used for this purpose called the KGC Golden Bloom, which had a cross on it and the words Union Power Legion and an abbreviated form of American. The meetings occurred in backstair venues and even in the woods. Members were encouraged to attend with a weapon uh, to defend themselves. There were armed guards around the premises at all times. Uh, and the order was so secretive that the candidates were not informed of the true intentions of the order until they joined and were given the ability to decide whether they wanted to continue. However, there, there are accounts of retaliation for ex-members and ex-members being stalked by knights, um, I would imagine, to make sure that no secrets were divulged. The target audience was Southern gentlemen uh, that had slave dependent businesses, and they wanted anyone with the passion to separate from the North uh, and believed in slavery, except they didn't want drunkards or gamblers or rowdies or convicts or idiots or foreigners or non-whites. They did have a youth program um, working with young men between the age of eight and 16 until they became of age to join the order. Also had a women's auxiliary. Um, and only after an extreme um, interview and background check did an initiate make it through. Um, they were paired up with a senior member to show them the ropes and a really interesting thing is that senior member worked with no more than 12 uh, initiates. And even the senior knights didn't know the members outside of the 12 they worked with. So while it was pretty well known that the, the KGC existed, what was truly secretive is who their members were. And to this day, nobody really can say what happened within the castle walls. The, the shift to secessionist views, uh, in the beginning, a lot of the themes were let's, let's expand and use filibustering as a way uh, to get more um, influence, but eventually it, it went to more of a theme of secessionism and ultimately uh, it, it appears based on what I was reading that the election of Abraham Lincoln really shifted that. I uh, put a lot of fear in, in, in slaveholding Southerners that uh, this, this unknown figure of a new party was basically going to take the slaves away and ruin the South economy. There are many downfalls uh, to this society and, and its, its success and existence. Uh, one is a failed alliance with Northern Mexico uh, to take over the country. Uh, there was conflict in, in going in Mexico between the North and the South. Um, from the sources I saw, Southern Mexico was, was very supportive of the Catholic Church, whereas Northern Mexico was, was trying to move away from their influence. Uh, additionally, in, there were two failed military campaigns in 1860 to invade Mexico. A uh, few people showed up to take part in that, and those that did show were late. Uh, Bickley made a tremendous amount of excuses about this, and ultimately the Knights in Texas ousted him as their leader. Uh, but he did pull together a convention impromptu 29 days later and forced his reinstatement uh, as the, at the head figure of the Knights of the Golden Circle. About this time, uh, Texas Governor Sam Houston decreed a cease and desist on all KGC activities uh, in March of 1860. But Bickley continued to spread spin in the newspapers and went on a recruitment tour until 1861, exaggerating the numbers of the remaining knights um, and, and spinning tall tales of taking over Washington. The timing on this was bad with Lincoln going into office in 1861. This caused a tremendous amount of, of bad press, a focus on the KGC and paranoia in general, and investigated, uh, investigative reporters um, began to expose 
the KGC and even further tabloid press went on and even further exaggerated uh, the activities that the KGC was involved in. One of the things that, that seemed to hamper um, the KGC as well was the secessionist views. There were some, some slavery expansionists that did not want to secede from the Union. Most notable of that is Sam Houston, uh, who actually voted against uh, breaking, having, breaking away and forming the Confederacy. And because of, of the lack of, of results on the campaigns and funding questions and so forth, there were many in the order that questioned Bickley's leadership and he lost credibility. So where was the beginning of the downfall of the KGC? Really, it, it, it happened with the election of Abraham Lincoln. Um, that really was one of the, the factors that, that sparked uh, the Civil War. And as a result, members of the KGC had to focus on the Confederacy. And Bickley himself became a Confederate surgeon. It's interesting that he was arrested for spying in Indiana and ended up becoming um, a prisoner of war and died of unknown causes in 1857. As an aside, many of the activities that were going on at this time, uh, questions with regard to um, trying to stop Lincoln from taking the, the office of the presidency, um, basically made it uh, an act of treason to be a member of the KGC in the North. So what happened to them? Well, historians think that they all but disbanded in the Civil War. Uh, there are conspiracy theorists that think otherwise. Where are they now? Well, this is an interesting question. Um, there were some newspaper articles at the end of the Civil War. Uh, one such article was in the Daily Times of Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, there was a spotlight on the Pawpaw militia, uh, militia that was absorbed by the KGC. And there was a confession by one Andrew E. Smith, a 22-year-old that was a member of Captain Johnston's company of, of Pawpaw and a member of the KGC. And he said something along the lines of, even though Robert E. Lee uh, surrendered his army in Northern Virginia, April 9th, 1865, the KGC continues to work to achieve their goals. And after the war became even more secretive than they were before. And in an 1864 Holt report, uh, KGC planted major, major treasure and goods repository in every state of the Union uh, and Canada, Mexico, and countries in Central America and South America that were um, cryptically located vaults safeguarded by symbols and clues. And there were rumors of the order renaming itself to names like Order of the American Knights and Order of the Sons of Liberty. Another thing that more than one of my sources talked about is um, an order that came up after the Civil War from Confederate uh, soldiers that were looking for fraternity. And the first two words of that order in Latin uh, mean something very similar to circle. And those words are Ku Klux. So there are some that believe that the KGC um, evolved to become the Ku Klux Klan. Some rumored members. Um, this is an interesting one and a caveat. This is, uh, does anybody know who this is? No. This is actually Sam Houston. Um, and the reason I caveat it is because he was excited to be an initiate until he found out what their scheme was. As I mentioned, he was a unionist and did not want to see the southern states secede. 
So he very quickly uh, withdrew. How about this one? Anybody know who this is? No, this is John Wilkes Booth. Oh, Casper. Sorry? Casper, the friend of the coast. I got a white screen in front of me. <laughs> uh -oh. oh, there it is. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so this is, this is John Wilkes Booth, and his membership has actually been attested by more than one night. Um, there is a belief that the KGC was actually behind Lincoln's assassination, and this was one of the underlying themes. I'm not giving any tremendous spoilers for the National Treasure sequel because you find that out very quickly into the movie, but that was one of the underlying themes. Um, when I was looking through Wikipedia, too, I found out that there were several members of Buchanan's administration that were somehow known KGC members. Um, examples include James Mason, who, who was a secessionist uh, senator, John Floyd, who was a Secretary of War, Howell Cobb, who was in the Treasury Department, and John Breckinridge, who was the VP. As I had mentioned, there were designs to keep Lincoln from making his inauguration in Washington by kidnapping him in Baltimore. And that scheme was, was found out and ultimately stopped. Um, I believe it was Lincoln using an alternate route in a disguise. But this coming um, to realization and, and understanding that this scheme was underway really is what caused tremendous paranoia um, in the North with regard to what um, secret societies and copperheads would mean to the future of the United States. This one is fascinating um, and deserves a talk all on its own. Anybody recognize this guy? Is that William H. Bonney? Nope. Um, I think you're close, though. Well, maybe. Who Did he have an alias? Mm -hmm. What's his well, alias? Billy the Kid. Nope. You're very close. That's Jesse James. Okay, that was my second guess. Yep. Both uh, very young and uh, dressed very well. Yep. And so before I get into Jesse James, understanding this man is really important uh, for Jesse James' lineage to the Confederacy. This is William Clark Quint Quintrell. Quintrell. Um, and, and there were territory disputes between Missouri and the Kansas territories. And basically, um, this gentleman in, in the Civil War um, was very brutal and, and bloody with his tactics, so much so that um, Jefferson Davis refused to elevate his rank beyond captain. But because he got things done, um, a lot of the field commanders respected him and continued to give him men. Uh, and he, he ended up with a group of men called the Quantrill Raiders that grew as large as 500. And Frank James, Jesse James, and Cole Younger were all members of this group. As an aside, uh, on the other side, um, in the Kansas Territory, on the side of the north, their, their nemesis would have been the Jayhawkers from Kansas. Ultimately, uh, Quantrill was mortally wounded in 1865, and the group disbanded. And the reason that's kind of important to the legend is it said that Jesse James was not just a member of the, the KGC, but he was a high-ranking official that was basically charged with uh, stealing from northern banks and industry in order to help fund the Confederacy. And because there are questions about where uh, his loot is stored, uh, it's, it's caused legends about um, caches of gold throughout the United States and, and all the places that, that, that I believe it was a Holt report had mentioned. Um, 
Is it true? Well, there's multiple books that say that, that it is. Um, and there is a documented case that I've, I found in a few sources. Uh, in 1934, Theodore Jones and Henry Grob of Baltimore, Maryland, were searching their yard with metal detectors and came, a pot, a rust, uh, came across a rusted pot of 5,000 gold coins. And one of my sources said that uh, engraved on the side of these coins was the great seal of the case of the GC. So with topics like Jesse James and Minnesota connections and, and uh, all the rabbit holes we could go down, I could continue on and on, but I'm going to stop here and hopefully have, have done enough to spark your imagination and desire to do additional research into an era that I, I find troublingly fascinating. And although I am not a historian, um, I'll open it up to any questions you may have and I'll do my best. Well, that was uh, absolutely incredible uh, presentation. Very, you know, absolutely thoughtful, thought booking, but, uh, informative it, it, it answered a lot of things that uh or reflected on a lot of things that i kind of remembered growing up as well brad and that was you know kind of that there was more of a monetary drive around some of the civil war because there was already a lot of thought about that you know making it illegal to have slaves was kind of something there but um one of the things i did want to ask you about do you feel or did you find any uh, connection with that. I, I, I had to look it up while you were uh, while you were giving your presentation, but in 1871 with the uh, the KKK Act that uh, Grant had signed in. Did you find, was there any connection with maybe some of that in the, the closing of, of this uh, organization? I, I didn't go there. Um, I, I really tried to stay before the war and understand the factors that led to it and what would cause this group to, to be created. Um, I know enough to know that it was a group of four, four or five Confederate soldiers that began the organization, um, and it was meant to, to fill a void of, of uh, belonging and, and fraternal stuff that they were seeing in, in some of the universities, but it very quickly got out of hand, uh, and there was a period of time where they were outlawed, and then they resurfaced later, and that's about all I could tell you. What's the secret? Hey, Brett, uh, thanks for that presentation. Really very well researched. And um, I, uh, some time ago, I ran across them too. So this was a good refresher. Um, and my recollection was that they had infiltrated uh, pretty much, or pretty much a lot of significant um, roles within government, uh, even in Washington. And I think that wasn't that part of their plot to, to do a, a subliminal takeover. Uh, could you expand a little bit more on that? I, I can't remember exactly how it worked. That's, that is basically my understanding as well. Um, and, and I had mentioned a couple of the, the people that were in Buchanan's administration. But I'll, I'll also uh, say that based on the fact that their second degree was on political type th uh, themes, um, that speaks to that as well. I don't have any other specific examples, but that's very believable based on what I had seen. Yeah, it's really fascinating to see how they, in a, in a very subliminal way, I mean, while it was more or less kind of a rowdy and, and, and kind of a, a giving the speeches and making noise, but in a very subliminal way, uh, penetrated into the significant roles of government or, and trying to work their agenda from there. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's so many groups that, that have that, that mystery, you know, that it's it's just, I try, I know it was part of, the, of, of, their their whole scheme based on what i've read but i try not to give it too much credibility because there are numbers of groups um that have this legend as well um so it's it's hard to say i mean in, in fact um 
based on the, the fact that they were secretive about who the members were. Uh, I wanted to be very careful about who, who I called out as members unless I saw some really credible sources. Brad, I want to thank you for all your time and uh, efforts uh, that went into this presentation. Uh, the KGC has uh, always uh, been intriguing to me, uh, but I never did uh, much follow up and uh, do any research on it. Uh, so this was uh, very enlightening and I appreciate this uh, very much. Of course, brother. I will thank you for the kind words. I, I will say um, this has only been an interest for a couple of years and it's, it's researching them uh, has brought up new fascinations like Jesse James apparently was a pretty fascinating individual. Of course, he has Minnesota ties. Um, so that's, that's the next rabbit hole that I'm finding myself going down is trying to better understand Jesse James. Yeah, my, my wife and I were just up in Northfield not that long ago and went by the bank. And I thought that's something I need to do is a little bit more research on, uh, on uh, him and the different gangs. Yeah. So um, the, there were a couple of things that, that I'll share with you brothers that I, that I really took away from this. And it's one is how long this festered before it, it, it started the civil war. And it's, you know, a couple of, of LEO sessions ago, we talked about how important conversations were, are. Um, and this, this is a, a value shift and um, it's it's just it's it's a shame that it, it went this way um, but it's also an interesting uh, reflection on evolution uh, a viewpoint and uh, by no means did did that end <laughs> with this conflict you know it continues and to go way out there uh, someday in the future uh, AI might go in a direction we never expected and and we'll be having conversations about the rights of machines that are self-aware um there's just some really interesting themes to reflect on given all of this and, and understanding the discussions and evolution yeah and, and the, <clears throat> this whole north south thing was running really deep uh and just kind of a to add to this, uh, Pike, Albert Pike himself was really, um, <clears throat> I should say a lot of his work was influenced by that very same position. Meaning that when he's talking in his lectures in Morals and Dogma about uh, oppression of the state and the, the various uh, kind of a victimization of the individuals within the state or by the state, what he is specifically referring to is the North. That's really our, I mean, it's, an, it's a, a central theme in a lot of his lectures that are, if you kind of a, take it out of the generalization and put it in the, in the context of the time where he lived, in the tension that were between North and South, um, that is a lot of his, his motivation. And to him, it was a, a practical kind of a dilemma that was overarching in, in what, what he wrote in, in, in his uh, rituals and morals and dogma and other work. Uh, Brad, this is uh, Tim Gaynor. Uh, just thank you very much for this presentation and all of the presentations you've been putting on. Hans, you too. Uh, this Zoom has uh, really meant a lot to me uh, since I moved down here to Florida. Um, thank you very much for the time you guys have put into all of this work here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I, I, I love seeing brothers all the time. So, um, and I love, I love learning. Uh, and, and every time I come to one of these sessions, I learn from all of you. And the beauty of it is if you start researching a, a topic, you you really kind of uh, dive in, right? So what we see is in essence only the surface from of, of what you kind of had to accumulate and kind of digest. Or um, I'm not saying you become a domain expert on it, but 
are it goes a lot deeper than what we as the audience see so um you know, that's the kind of the fun part of it worshipful brother that's i just sent you a, i just uh, sent you a text and uh, don't don't dig into that now it goes in relation with something you mentioned but uh, I want to I want to jump back into this Jesse James and our, our, our Minnesota tie here and fire up a little bit of that internal kid in you. Um, what is that? Uh, has it been? I mean, I'm sure it's out there. Kind of what is the historian say was kind of Jesse James uh, uh, worth? And then in relation to that uh, two part is is uh, what's kind of been recovered. Do you have any uh, direction or inflection on that? I I don't yet. Um, if there are others that have researched him, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I did just get a, a book that talks about uh, his life and connection into the, the KGC, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Anybody have any, any info for Shannon as far as Jesse James? Okay. Maybe we'll have to take a, a meeting up in uh, Northfield at uh, one of their uh, annual events. At, uh, so now that the state is lifted up to some forms of normalcy, right? Yeah. That I remember as a, as a kid reading about it, and that's kind of why I brought it up was to see if there was more. But, you know, it, uh, I, was a, I was a young man that spent many times uh, in books of old Western uh, outlaws. And, and uh, if I remember correctly, it was only about 25% of, of his estimated worth was ever really recovered because he was so good at, at being able to have like locations and he, he, he really understood relationships and how to work with people, you know, and it was, he had lots of uh, opportunities throughout. So it does not surprise me that his, his you know, money's not been stumbled upon or those that have really didn't know what it was and just brought it somewhere, you know. There, there is, I, I, I don't think I mentioned it. I, I had meant to, there is some thought that the mystery glyphs in the Southwest are some of the symbols uh, to the caches. And there is a like uh, backward, a uh, forward J, backward J together that kind of look like uh, an anchor. And that was apparently his symbol. Um, as an interesting aside, kind of a personal one, uh, I'm, I'm very good friends with a descendant of, of Jesse James. And the funny part, we, we always laugh about this, is my grandmother always told me that her grandfather was on the posse that caught Jesse James. Um, now, there, there are some pretty interesting uh, legends about that, too, and that he really wasn't caught um, and that he, he lived on into the 1950s. So this is really what's sparking my interest uh, there, there are also some that say that those who, who caught up with him were in, in fact his friends and let him go. So some of this is trying to understand, you know, some of my family history as well, as well as my, my good friend in, in Castle Manorville Lodge. Beautiful town, by the way. I've had a chance now to eat at the, uh, the Hubble House. In oh, Manorville. you did go? across the street there to the uh the manterville saloon so um yeah it's uh there's been a few fridays where it's been late uh getting down to work and getting them stocked up but yeah it's a nice i do want to hook up with you um uh, and head down and uh, meet up i think you said that's on wednesdays uh it depends. Last wednesday of the month second, second tuesday fourth wednesday fourth wednesday fourth wednesday yeah. And then any of you brothers that come down this way, I'll buy you dinner at the Hubble House if you meet up with me. It is it is a wonderful historical town. The, it's on the old wagon trail. They've got Grant's signature in, in the registry there. If you've never been there, it's worth going. The restaurant, uh, since Brad is being so nice about it, was 1854. It was the first time they uh, slung a beer or served a plate. So that's pretty impressive. It's a beautiful town. You do need to go early and check it out and just sit by the waterfall for a bit. In the park right sign up, brothers. So thanks again, Brad. Thank you. We'll Look see forward you. to chatting with you more soon. Bye bye, brothers. Bye. Take care. Good to see you. Okay. Yeah, the uh what's that? I I was just go ahead. No, I was can say the uh the jesse james has always kind of uh fascinated me in that down in that north field and it's funny how time runs by because we've always talked about wanting to get down and check that event out 
one thing leads to another. 